So welcome back to our series on the book of Revelation. Today's passage in chapter 13 is one of the more difficult and debated in the whole book. So how about we just jump right in? Sound good? All right, let's pray. Lord, may your word be our rule, your spirit our teacher, and the glory of Jesus our single concern. Amen. Amen. Do whatever you need to do to listen well to these words from the book that we love. Then the dragon stood on the seashore, and I saw a beast coming up out of the sea. It had ten horns and seven heads, and each of its horns was decorated with a royal crown, and on its heads were written blasphemous names. The beast I saw was like a leopard. It had feet like a bear's and a mouth like a lion's mouth. The dragon gave it his power, throne, and great authority. One of its heads appeared to be slain and killed, but its deadly wound was healed. The whole world was amazed and went out to follow the beast. They worshipped the dragon because he had given the beast its authority, and they worshipped the beast, saying, Who is like the beast? And who can fight against it? The beast was given a mouth that spoke boastful and blasphemous things, and it was given authority to act for 42 months. It opened its mouth and blasphemed against God. It blasphemed God's name, and it blasphemed his dwelling place, that is, those who dwell in heaven. It was also allowed to make war on the saints and to gain victory over them. It was given authority over every tribe and nation and language and people. All those who live on the earth worship it, all whose names aren't written from the time the world was made in the book of life that belongs to the Lamb who was slain. Whoever has ears must listen. If any are to be taken captive, into captivity they will go. If any are to be killed by the sword, by the sword they will be killed. This calls for great endurance and faithfulness on the part of the saints. And then I saw another beast coming up out of the earth. It had two horns like a lamb, but it was speaking like a dragon. It exercises all the authority of the first beast when it's in his presence, and it also makes the earth and all who live in it worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. It does great signs, so that it even makes fire come down from heaven to earth in the presence of the people. It deceives those who live on earth by the signs it's allowed to do in the presence of the beast. And it told those who live on earth to make an image of the beast who had been wounded by the sword and yet came back to life again. And it was allowed to give breath to the beast's image so that it might even speak and that it might cause those who refuse to worship the beast's image to be put to death. And it forces everyone, small and great, rich and poor, free and slaves, to have a mark put on their right hand or on their forehead. And it will not allow anyone to purchase anything or sell anything unless the person has the mark of the beast's name or the number of its name. This calls for wisdom. Let the one who understands calculate the beast's number, for it is a human being's number. Its number is 666. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen. Last week, the dragon had been thrown down from heaven to earth. The dragon has been... Uh, thwarted in its attempt to chase after the woman who's held safe now out in the wilderness. 
And so as this passage opens, that dragon is standing on the seashore. And we watch as a beast now emerges out of the sea in front of us. We saw in chapter 12 last week that from the mouth of the dragon comes a river like floodwaters to chase after the woman in the desert. And here, a beast that looks oddly like the dragon emerges out of the waters of the sea. And it comes to receive the dragon's power, throne, and great authority. What's the beast? Well, we should know by now that Revelation is thoroughly soaked in the Old Testament and no book features more prominently than the book of Daniel. If you're ever confused in Revelation, just go read Daniel and it will probably make some sense. The chapter this time is Daniel chapter 7. There, Daniel watches as four beasts rise out of the sea in succession. And if you keep reading in that chapter, an angel explains to Daniel what it is he's seeing. These four beasts are four kings, four successive empires that rise up, each one more powerful and terrible than the one that had come before it. And they will each be given kingship and power and authority for a time, times, and half a time, the angel tells Daniel. Until, at the end of that time, the Ancient of Days holds his court The final judgment removes the authority from those beasts and gives it to the Son of Man and to the saints that follow him. What is the beast? Well, if you go and read that chapter and you can do it later, what becomes apparent is that the beast John sees in Revelation 13 is like a composite of those four beasts from Daniel 7. It's like Voltron, or like the Transformers combiners, you know, the multiple machines that form together into one giant super one. This is the super beast. And it is now the way in which the dragon is attempting to exercise its power and authority and rule for evil in the world. Whereas those four beasts in Daniel represented individual empires, this beast... The super beast represents empire in general, the nation state, whenever it rises up to claim total authority and total power over our lives with all the violence that that always entails in the world. And in John's day, the super Voltron beast that was ruling in the world was Rome. And one detail John adds a little bit later is a good hint of this. He says one of the heads appears to be slain and killed, but its deadly wound is healed and the whole world is amazed. Many believe this is a description of Rome in the decades immediately prior to John's writing this. Rome, if you remember from your world history courses, It was established as an empire under Caesar Augustus, who took over after his adoptive father, Julius, was murdered. He was the first emperor, and he's crowned in 27 BC, reigned for something like 50 plus years. But by 68 AD, just under 100 years later, everything seemed to be falling apart. The repugnant emperor Nero had just killed himself after a disastrous season ruling as emperor, And four generals successively marched on Rome, conquered it, killed the one who'd come before them, and claimed the role of emperor for themselves. It seemed like the empire was going to fall apart until the fourth of those, Vespasian, suspended his campaign against Jerusalem, marched to Rome, conquered, became the fourth emperor, and he lasted for ten years. Shortly after conquering Rome, his son and would-be heir, Titus, finished his work in Jerusalem, destroying the city and burning the temple to the ground. Within a couple years, there were five different emperors. The temple in Jerusalem was destroyed, and the empire was in a constant state of flux. It looked like the head had been mortally wounded. And yet out of the ashes... The empire rises again. 
who is like the beast and who can fight against it. But I think the first beast is more than just a symbol of military power and authority and empire because the head that was slain and healed also seems to be a parody of Jesus, don't you think? He was already introduced as the lamb who stands as though slain. He is the one who conquers by dying and rising again. He's the one given his father's throne. He's the one given authority over every people, nation, language, and tribe. The beast is just a parody. It's just a bad copy, a fake, an imposter. And it's claiming power, authority, and rule that is not rightfully its. Even its worship song, Who is Like the Beast, is just a cheap copy of Moses' hymn that was used in a number of psalms, Who is Like the Lord Our God. The first beast that comes up out of the sea with ten horns and seven heads, themselves symbol of total power and authority, is Rome. But it's also Babylon. And it's also Persia, and it's also Greece, and it's also every empire and every nation that claims this authority for itself, that demands our ultimate allegiance and tries to take the place of God, supplant the true Lord, the Lamb who was slain. And speaking of lambs, John then sees another beast, not come up out of the sea, but this one comes up out of the earth. And it has two horns like a lamb. The parody continues, apparently. A lamb appears, just like the lamb who appeared in the throne room back in Revelation 5. But this lamb is speaking like a dragon. It's not a wolf in sheep's clothing. It's a dragon in lambskin. It's speaking like a dragon. The dragon, remember, is the deceiver of the whole world. And so this second beast, too, takes up the work of deception. It fools the people of the world and tricks them into worshiping the first beast, even convincing them to make an idol, an image, even animating that image to trick them into worshiping the beast and by worshiping the beast, worshiping the dragon who gives him its authority. And yet, if we look closer at this second beast, it's not just a hype man for the first. This appears to be a parody of something, too. We're told that it's given the power to do great signs in the presence of the people, just like Moses had done. It's also given the power to call down fire from heaven to earth, just like Elijah Moses and Elijah, they were our two witnesses back in chapter 11 that stood for a symbol of the whole church in its role as witness in the world. It seems this second beast with two horns is also impersonating the two olive trees, the two lampstands, the two witnesses, the church in its role of witness in the world. If the first beast is a parody of Jesus, the second beast is a parody of the church. And it goes on to be described with language that make it an evil imposter for the Holy Spirit and for the prophets and the church as witnesses. And just like it's our role to bear witness to Jesus, to call forth faith from the world, it's the beast's role to call forth worship for the first beast and to demand ultimate allegiance. This is the role of the second beast the propaganda machine of the first, the hype man, the anti-apostle or false prophet of the anti-Christ, and it's spreading an anti-gospel. In John's day, Caesar is Lord, and Rome is the bringer of peace. This is the role of the second beast. And for the seven churches who first received these letters, they would have known exactly what it referred to the fastest growing religion of their day, the worship of the emperors. What we know from archaeological evidence is each of those seven cities had local temples and statues and shrines for the Caesars, for the emperors, 
We know that their leaders were fighting amongst each other for the privilege always of building new, bigger temples and shrines to the emperor, that they were forcing the worship of the Caesars on their people to make themselves look good before the empire, that if they could force their whole cities to offer grander and grander sacrifices to Caesar, they might earn Caesar's favor and the power and wealth that came along with it. We know that some of those cities the residents were forced that when the imperial parade would come by their house, they would have to go out and offer sacrifices to it. That in their trade guilds, they not only worshipped the gods of their individual trades, but also began at this time to worship the emperor. So what are you to do as a Christian in that context? As a tiny, powerless minority in the midst of the empire, what are you to do? Do you go along to get along? I mean, is it really that big of a deal to offer one little sacrifice to Caesar? It's not too big, right, to do just a little compromise here or there so that you can continue to provide for your family, so you can make a living, so that you can get some work. I mean, Jesus will forgive you anyway if you do this little thing. You know where your heart really belongs, right? Is it that big of a deal to compromise to save your name and your place in society? Well, in those seven letters that are an introduction to this book, it is clear that the churches faced this decision. It's clear that there were false teachers among them telling them it was okay to compromise, that they were facing persecution, some of them to the point of death, for refusing to participate in the empire's worship that they were tempted to value the health of their economy over their fidelity to Jesus. That Jesus' message to those seven churches in the midst of all of that is always the same. Persevere. Endure. Do not compromise. Strive on and remain faithful so that you can conquer in the end. And by now, we should have learned that conquering in the book of Revelation doesn't always look like what we want it to look like. After all, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David who has conquered, is a lamb who was slain. And we are that lamb's army of martyrs. Authority over every tribe and nation and language and people has been given to the beast for 42 months. There's that Time again, 1,260 days, 42 months, three and a half years, as Daniel said it, a time, times, and half a time. The symbolic period of persecution, of evil, before God's judgment comes. And in case we haven't yet connected the dots, John pauses from that vision and tells us, makes sure we hear exactly what he's saying. It was verses 9 and 10. Whoever has ears must listen. If any are to be taken captive, then into captivity they'll go. If any are to be killed by the sword, then by the sword they will be killed. This calls for great endurance and faithfulness on the part of the saints. In other words, I wasn't kidding back in chapter 11. I wasn't kidding. I meant what I said. The two witnesses of God will be killed. The church will be trampled and the world will rejoice when it happens. And this is God's plan. God's kingdom will come to earth. God's will will be done as it is in heaven when the church follows the way of Jesus. Holding fast to its witness, even to the point of death. And it's in embracing that witness with our lives, enduring the evil of the world for Jesus' sake, accepting persecution and death as it comes, and allowing God's grace and mercy to be made real and alive in us. It's then that the nations will repent. It's then that the kingdom of this world becomes the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he will reign forever and always. And as John says, this requires much endurance and faithfulness on the part of the saints. But as he says after the second beast, it also requires great wisdom. 
and great discernment. For when are we to know when a nation becomes the beast? Which are the false prophets? Which signs come from God and which ones are done by the second beast, acting on the authority of the first and the dragon? And what does any of this mean for us? We who are privileged enough not to live in an age of open persecution, while there are Christians around the world today who do, does this have anything to say to us? I think it does. Because I think that every nation, at some time or place, begins to act like the beast. And I think in America we have been generally too distracted trying to figure out the personal identity of the Antichrist, the name that means 666, to recognize the way in which our political parties and the nation itself have risen up to claim total and ultimate allegiance and become, in a way, beast-like. To recognize the compromises we're asked to make to get along and the worship we willingly give to the beast of empire and economy that claims to be our savior. I think Christians do sometimes get distracted by the mark of the beast and the 666 and trying to figure out who this figure is. So, spoiler alert, it's not Trump and it's not Biden and the first hearers would have known exactly who it was because it was Nero, Emperor Nero. When you take its, his letters, assign numerical values, and add it up, it's 666. And while he would have been dead by the time John wrote this letter down, if you had to conjure up a picture of the evil of empire, the excesses of wealth, of evil and immorality and violent persecution of Christians, there would have been no better candidate to bring to mind than Nero. And yet 666 is also just shy of seven three times over. Seven, the number for persecution or for perfection and completion in the Hebrew mindset. We come almost but not quite three times. It's like an unholy trinity of imperfection. The perfection of the incomplete. And in a way, every leader and every nation begins to take on this 666 when it begins to act like Nero, claiming total allegiance and authority that isn't its. And what about the mark of the beast on the hand or the forehead? Well, this isn't a barcode tattoo. It's not a microchip vaccine that Bill Gates and the New World Order are going to demand we get. It's a direct reference to Deuteronomy 6 and the Shema, the prayer of allegiance that Jews prayed three times a day. It goes like this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord alone. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. Keep these words that I'm commanding you today in your heart. Recite them to your children. Talk about them when you're at home and when you're away, when you lie down and when you rise up. Bind them as a sign on your hand. Fix them as an emblem on your forehead. Write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. As the Jews prayed each day, offering their allegiance to the Lord, their God, and their God alone, as they pledge their ultimate allegiance, God's word is sealed on their foreheads and on their hands to guide their thinking and their doing, their believing and their living. This mark is the anti shema the sign of our ultimate allegiance given not to God as it ought to be, but to the beast. So don't get bogged down trying to figure out who this is. Realize instead that whenever we are tempted to believe that a politician or a party or a policy are going to save us, 
are going to fix everything, are going to bring heaven to earth finally, we're being tempted to follow the beast. That whenever we place our hope and our faith in the stock market or economy and are willing to sacrifice justice or ethics for its good and growth, it's the second beast that's speaking in our ear. That whenever we progress from good and right patriotism to believing that our nation is special, God's nation, and that our enemies are therefore God's enemies, we would do well to remember that the image atop our nation's capital is the goddess Columbia, and we may just be worshiping an idol of the beast. I don't think any of that means we should become separatists and take that posture from the world where we just back off and don't engage in anything to remain pure. There have been Christians throughout the ages that have adopted that posture, but I think a better model for us is Israel when they were in exile is Daniel, whose book John loves to quote. Daniel, who was himself an exile, who was conscripted into service for first the Babylonian Empire and then the Persian one after it. He and his friends, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they were too, and they took Babylonian names. They wore Babylonian clothing. They served with the whole of their wisdom and skill to make the system around them better. They did what Jeremiah instructed in Jeremiah 29. Seek the good of the city where I send you into exile. Pray to the Lord on its behalf, for in its flourishing you'll find your flourishing. But they didn't adapt to the nations and culture around them without intense discernment. When they were commanded to worship Babylonian gods or to pray to the emperor, they politely refused and bore witness to the God of Israel, not flinching before lion's dens and fiery furnaces, with great wisdom, endurance, and faithfulness, all of which John now commends to us, they remained faithful even in a foreign land. So what does all this mean for us in an election year? Well, humility, certainly. But measure, I think, too. I think it's the second beast that winds us up whenever we start to hear that this is the most pivotal election in our nation's history. Because whatever happens, we know who sits on the real throne, right? And whatever happens will not change our calling as followers of Jesus in the world to endure in faithfulness, no matter the cost, to discern the beast, and to offer our witness to the Lamb who was slain and has conquered. Amen?